You can't fight in here. This is the war room. Shit filters full. Really? Yeah. I always go backwards when I'm backing up. What are you under? Yeah, he's got to do something for a living these days. Diane ain't much of a living boy. You failed to maintain your weapon, son. It's Liberty! He, he's hurt! Whiskey, quick. Master, we are here. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. <laughs> <laughs> Wise man. Something is going to happen. What's going to happen? Something wonderful. You can call it the art of fighting without fighting. We started a game we never got to finish. I was just fooling about. I wasn't. Why don't you make like a tree and get the fuck out of here? Give me liberty or give me death. <laughs> Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ernest Emerson Podcast, a podcast where both you and I get to talk with, listen to, and ask questions of some of the most interesting people in the world. We only have one disclaimer. If you are offended by the truth, please go away. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to and thank you for joining me for today's Ernest Emerson podcast. I'm here this morning with Danny T. Good morning, Danny. Good morning, Ernie. I just wanted to start off today's podcast with a couple of special announcements. And uh, the first one is this. We've been getting a lot of questions from the Internet, from all you people out there, so we decided to host our first question and answer podcast. It seems like a lot of you are very curious about all things Emerson, so it's time we get to answering some of those questions. We are also going to be doing something that we haven't done yet, which is have a live feed via either Facebook and Instagram. Don't know exactly because I'm not the tech end of this. Uh, So you'll be able to actually uh, watch us while we're doing the podcast and answering the questions. And uh, so be sure to mark this date. Uh, the date that this will happen is October 18th, 2018, and it'll take place at 0900, that's 9 o'clock a.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's California time, okay? And uh, you'll be able to access it via the, uh, I guess, Instagram or Facebook, uh, but we'll we'll put some announcements uh, either on the podcast site and or Emerson Knife site to uh, give you the right directions to get there. And there's also still time to send in uh, the questions or any questions you have uh, by going over to the Q&A post on Emerson Knives Incorporated Instagram. So if you want to know something, just ask. Uh, You can ask me anything. Uh, You can ask me about anything, and I'll do my best to answer. It'll be a lot of fun. And I think it's safe to say that most of you know that I am a custom handmade knife maker and that I also own a knife company. In fact, I've got almost 40 years of skin in that game. So the second announcement is going to be that I will be doing a knives-only podcast, and that will go up on a date which we will announce, and uh, I just don't have it nailed down yet. But I will be talking about the history of knives, swords, weapons, famous knives throughout history, the history of custom knife making as, as best I can relate it, Uh, the history and story of Emerson Knives, and the reason that I make knives. I'll also be talking about the technical aspects of knife making, materials, and how and what goes into the design and manufacture of an Emerson knife. And uh, this one is shaping up to be a a fun podcast because I'm writing a lot of notes, so it could be a long one, let's just say that. But uh, it'll be uh, all about knives because we've had a lot of people... uh, ask questions uh, just over the years, actually, not just when, since we've started the podcast, but all about uh, why do you do this, what do you, what do you use to do that, how come this, what do you know about that, and uh, I'm going to do my best to uh, cover a lot of ground uh, regarding knives, uh, because you guys seem to be very interested in that, as I am also. So, we'll announce that date, and uh, that'll be fun. 
And then the third announcement is going to be the uh, annual Emerson Christmas Virtual Knife Show. And as many of you know, uh, you know, people travel thousands of miles to go to a knife show uh, just to enter the Emerson Lottery. And uh, many times there are several thousand uh, entrants in our lottery vying just for the chance to purchase uh, an Emerson knife. And uh, most of the time when I go to a show, I only have around 40 knives. And uh, so the picking's pretty slim and the odds are pretty tough sometimes for someone to... Uh, to, to get a hold of an actual handmade Ernest Emerson custom knife. And uh, with my schedule, I can only finish about 30 to 40 for each show, so the chances of being drawn are, are, are always going to be pretty thin. And the fact that you have to travel all the way across the country to come to a show or actually come from Europe to go to the show just to get that chance because we don't... I, I don't sell knives any other way. I don't take orders, and uh, you, you have to participate in a lottery to get them. Uh, but through the wonders of the Internet, now you can also get the chance to own a handmade Emerson knife without ever leaving your soft, comfortable chair and your computer uh, terminal. Uh, we'll, we'll have all those details, and yes, there are some rules and regulations, and they will be able to be found on the Emerson Knives website. Uh, when we uh, make the announcement for the annual, annual Christmas show, uh, it'll be sometime in November, and uh, you'll be able to get uh, registered, uh, you'll be able to get all the details, time and date, and, and how to get your name in the, uh, the virtual hat, let's just say that. So, there you have it. Those are my announcements. Uh, so, keep, keep in touch with us uh, via our website and Instagram and Facebook and all those other things to keep up to date if you're at all interested in those things. Many of you know that I am big on legacy and that I believe in preserving our history. I'm, I'm an amateur historian myself. Uh, I read everything I can about history. Uh, I, I'm fascinated by it. I, I literally have two or three books going uh, at all times and uh, can be anything from uh, the history of mankind and its development, uh, the origin of the species, if you will, to uh, the secret German, uh, what they called the Wunderwaffe uh, projects that were taking place in World War II. So, I mean, I'm all over the place. Uh, uh, it can be any, anything, cosmology, it can be, you know, nutrition, whatever. But... I, I love the history and the story behind all of these things. And that, that's something that I think a lot of us uh, and a lot of young people are now not so interested in, not because they don't have a, I guess, personal interest in it, but that the world is moving so fast around us, especially the young uh younger generation now, with the complete uh, instantaneous uh, feed from the Internet at all times. And, you know, people check their Facebooks and Instagrams and all that, you know, every 10 or 15 minutes, it seems, uh, that there just isn't a lot of time uh, to sit and reflect or to look backwards because we're always looking at the here and now and maybe maybe towards the future. But, you know, the, the legacy, the history of who we are is – is what brought us to where we are. And, you know, f the story of your family, the, the story of this country, the story of the, uh, our culture, those are, those are important things because they help us to understand why we think the way we do, why do we have the ideas that we have, why do we have the beliefs that we have, and uh, give us direction uh, going towards the future. Because... You know, certain things should be passed on, uh, certain uh, family heritages, let's say, uh, should be passed on. And, and, you know, God bless the Mormons for uh, keeping all of the uh, records and things that they do, which allow people to go back and actually trace their lineage and all that. And, Danny, isn't that stuff available is that available to the general public also if someone wants to? Yeah, they have a genealogy library uh, throughout the country, multiple libraries, and they're all connected to a central database. 
And is some of that stuff available online for people that? Yes, I don't remember the website, but there is a, mm-hmm. a genealogy website. Anyone can sign up and yeah. look for their ancestors. And I don't think it's a uh, one of those pay-per-view type things, is it? No, I think it's completely free. Yeah. And, and so, you know, again, uh, in my my family's uh, history, we have a lot of records on one side, uh, notably the uh, the uh, my grandfather's side and all that. And uh, a lot of that comes from both Germany uh, or Austria, if you will, and uh, in England. And and thank goodness for all the English uh, record keeping and and order that they brought into the <laughs> to being in their society, uh, because it preserved a lot of stuff. And I can go all the way back, I think, to 1372 or something like that with the the surname Emerson. Uh, on the Irish side, not so much. Uh, I wonder why. Well, <laughs> it could be a lot of reasons, but uh, the not so much on the Irish side, and I believe a lot of it had to do with that they were they were pretty damn poor, and they were more concerned about uh, maybe uh, having a warm fire and some food in their belly uh, than writing down a whole bunch of records. So uh, I know we come from County Cork and stuff like that, but anyway, you know that's three or four generations back uh, in, in my. In my lineage, and it's gone. Uh, so you can lose family history and legacy in one generation. Uh, I I know that you know the things that I have from my grandfather are, are of course all the memories, but I have I have his hammers and his square and his planes and things like that, uh, and, and that's it. That's basically what I will pass down to either you know my daughters if they want some of that stuff or my son if he if he uh, wants those things but uh, you know it's it's just a token at this point I think the memories are uh, are valuable but the the story is really what is the most important thing so where I'm going with all of this is we need to be aware of these things and we need to preserve them we need to write things down to record things for gosh sakes uh, you can get you can get an app on your phone and just talk into it and say, you know what, my grandfather came from, you know, uh, Australia in 1903 and he had 38 cents in his pocket. You know, those stories need to be kept alive. They're, they're, they're the things that you can be proud of, the, the, the stories of how we got to where we are, those people who, who risked everything uh, and literally everything, sometimes their lives uh, to, to provide for us, the future generations. And I have to say that uh, today, having uh, experienced what I, what I did last week, uh, was a perfect example of a family legacy that has been passed down generation to generation to generation. And that is the Gracie family and the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu that has been passed down uh, in, in, in its entirety from generation to generation. And last week, uh, Thursday through Sunday, uh, we had the Hoist Gracie Black Belt Testing and Gracie Seminars. And we had, we had multi-generations of the uh, Gracie family here in our uh, on our uh, at our training facility, and it was wonderful to see that the Gracies really are a living example of that family lineage, that family legacy, that heritage of a tangible uh, uh, history that's being passed down and and cradled and fertilized and protected from generation to generation. Now, I can talk a little bit about this uh, today because now uh, we are uh, a day after the event has closed. And what it was was here at our uh, facility, the factory, uh, the guys call it, we had the uh, Hoist Gracie uh, Black Belt uh, testing session and the Gracie uh, seminars. And they took place uh, uh, Thursday Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of just the last week. And 
There were so many people here, I, I, I couldn't believe it. Uh, there were people from all over the world, literally. And uh, I think we had in excess of 30 uh, Gracie black belts here, Hoist Gracie black belts, and a number of uh, applicants, you know, vying for their black belt uh, also. And it was... Uh, I mean, we had well over 100-plus people on the mat at any given time. Now, that, that has nothing to do with the black belt uh, testing uh, because those are done uh, on a completely uh, closed-door uh, session with one individual at a time. So on top of all of the other things that were going on, uh, we had uh, the Gracie seminars. And... It was one of those kind of a historical moments in time because uh, what we had here was uh, Horion Gracie, Hoyler Gracie, Crossley Gracie, Hoist Gracie uh, giving seminars. And it, it was fantastic. There was over 100 plus people in each of these seminars. And there was an Ernest Emerson Edge Weapons Seminar also. And that was uh, one of the highlights of my, of my martial arts career, let's say that, to be uh, in the same place and time with, with these iconic uh, figures in the martial arts. So what I did was I, the first part of the uh, seminar was a lecture. So for about an hour I talked about knives, uh, the responsibility of knives, the legality of knives, and, and a whole bunch of things like that. So what we did was I had Danny record it, and then he translated it over. Uh, I, I believe the audio quality is good. Uh, he's real good at doing that kind of stuff. So what, what I am going to do today is I'm going to run the lecture part of the Ernest Emerson Edge Weapons Seminar 2018, at the Gracie seminars uh, that just took place this weekend. So for your uh, audio enjoyment, uh, please join me, and I hope that some of this uh, is of interest to you. It's the Ernest Emerson Edge Weapons Seminar 2018. I just wanted to say welcome, welcome to all of you uh, who have come from all over the world uh, to be here for the uh, Gracie seminars, the Hoist Gracie seminars, and the testing, if you're in that uh, group also. Um, this is a special thing, uh, it's very special, special for me, uh, it's the first time I've done this uh, to, to the, uh, the, the Gracie uh, family, if you will. And uh, I'm real, real honored to, to be able to do that. Uh, I do have one request. Uh, people have been, now I, I'm not a tech guy, so I'm going to butcher this up a little bit, but people have been uh, checking in to uh, social media under Emerson Knives, but I, I was uh, requested that you, you, if you check in, whatever that is, uh, you check in under Hoist Gracie uh, Jiu-Jitsu South Bay also, so that that word uh, gets out through that network. Okay? I like your shirt. I'm a big Rolling Stones fan. So, I've got two hours, and uh, I wish I had two days because we could do a lot of cool stuff. But I'm gonna. I, the reason that I, I printed these flyers was to be able to have you remember some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about because I'm going to be moving pretty fast through a lot of this because I want to get some good information out to you in addition to the time that we actually can do some of the techniques. So this is the first time I've ever printed anything up. If you see some typos in there. Uh, that's that's my fault. So let me just start. It's a privilege and an honor to stand here before you today. I know how long and how hard it is and what dedication and sacrifice it takes to get to this place and time. Thank you for the, allowing me the privilege to be here. Honestly, I only get this feeling, the, the, the feeling that I have right now in this group, uh, when I'm standing in front of... Uh, a bunch of soldiers, or Marines, or Navy SEALs, or Special Ops uh, Army guys. <clears throat> and why is that? 
The answer is because you are warriors. You are the chosen few. Why do we choose to do what we do? And I hope, I hope that you ask yourself that question. And I hope that you can have a good answer for it. I've been trying to figure that out my entire life. Why would I choose to suffer the pain, the injuries, and, and the hard work that you have to put in? I don't get paid for it. In fact, most of my life, I've actually paid other people to beat the hell out of me. Tell me what's wrong with that equation. But I love it. What the heck is wrong with me? Why do I like fighting? Why do I like violence? Because violence is a part of what we do. We choose to expose ourselves to violence, so when we meet violence, it's not a stranger. We are familiar with it. I figured I must just have a screw loose, and I used to think that a psychiatrist would have a field day if they were trying to figure me out. Then, in one of those brief moments when you have clarity of thought, I realized there's nothing wrong with me. I do these things to find myself, to find who I am. Because honestly, there are a few things in life that you can do where you have to face yourself stripped down to the bare bones where there's no pretense, no arrogance, no false self-esteem. When you are on the mat against an opponent, you find out exactly who you are very, very quickly. I do these things to find myself, to prepare myself for battle. I do these things just like you do because you are warriors. And warriors do these things not for fame, not for glory, but because it is in our nature. It is who we are. Our role, our eternal role, has always been to sacrifice ourselves for others, for their safety, protection, and freedom. Quite simply, a warrior is here today. A warrior will be here the next day. And a warrior will be back day after day, again and again, until his task is complete. Since time immemorial, warriors have always held a revered, honored, and respected place in society. In spite of all political meanderings and the ebb and flow of societal values, this has never changed, and it never will. There is an honor and pride in joining in this brotherhood that can be gained nowhere else. And once joined, can never be taken away. Although women are not excluded, and I see quite a few gals in here today, it has always been the man's role to be the protector and provider. Sorry if I sound sexist, but that's... That's the world that I came from. This is your responsibility and your role to uphold and honor in your time upon this earth. The responsibility of a warrior does not merely necessitate the taking up of arms against an enemy. It is more, much more. And it is such that you become an example, a role model of ethical and moral behavior to all others who may look to you for guidance or protection. If this is the path in life that you have chosen to walk, then know that it is a path well-worn by the footsteps 
of those who have walked here before you. Others who have willingly said, I will endure the hardship, the pain, the sacrifice, and the risk of death, so that those who sleep soundly in their beds can do so in the warm embrace of safety and peace. If this is your choice, then know that your road will be fraught with adversity and you will be assailed by many. But in those times, remember that you are in the company of the noble souls who have also faced such adversity and prevailed. Also know that your legacy shall be that until the end of time, as the last sun sets upon this earth, in that blackest night somewhere, a warrior still stands his lonely watch. I would ask that you indulge me for just a moment. I'm going to read a prayer from the Order of the Black Shamrock. Lord, we ask that you look upon our humble brethren with your infinite grace and blessings. We ask that you give us strength against our enemies when we are forsaken and grant us courage when we falter. We ask that you stay our hand with your mercy when we have none. We ask that you grant us wisdom when we are in need of guidance. We ask for your light to guide us when we dwell in darkness and know not the way. We ask that you protect our brethren from harm and temptation. We ask that our faith shall stand as our unbroken shield against all that is evil. We ask that you have mercy upon our soul at the time of our death. For we know that all things are possible through faith and through the blessings of your grace and mercy. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask a couple questions uh, just to get things kind of going. Uh, Are there any people in here that have concealed carry permits for pistols? Okay. Are there, are there people who carry a gun as a matter of a requirement for their job? Are there people in here with that? Okay. Let me ask the concealed carry people a question. Uh, why? Who, who had their hand up here? Why do you have a concealed carry permit? That's a proper answer. You, you, you have a concealed carry permit so you can carry a gun, which is the best self-defense tool that you can. Now, let me ask you a question. When would you use that gun in self-defense? Anybody? Excellent answer. When you feel you are in imminent danger, you can't retreat, loved ones, teammates, Friends, innocence. So when you pull that gun out, to because of that, what are you going to do with the gun? You're going to shoot. Okay. Would you ever pull that gun out for any other reason? Does everybody agree? You would never pull the gun out for any other reason, except to do what? Shoot somebody. Okay. Why would you shoot somebody? What's the purpose of discharging that firearm? I'm sorry. To kill them. That is the correct answer. There is no reason on earth ever to pull out a firearm, point it at somebody, unless you are willing to take the shot, and that shot has to be meant to kill. Okay? How many people in here carry a knife? quite a few and if you were to look at just the general population almost everybody out there has a knife in their pocket whether it's a Swiss army knife or something similar 
Well, they don't have concealed carry permits for knives. We're lucky in that regard. But when you stand in front of a police officer or a judge or a jury or a prosecuting attorney, a knife is a deadly weapon. And in the eyes of the law, it is exactly the same as a gun. Exactly. So, the purpose of civilian carry of a gun is to only use it if your life or the life of your loved ones is in imminent deadly danger. And if you deploy your weapon, gun, it is with the intent and purpose to kill another person. The exact same rules apply apply to making a decision to quote unquote pull out your knife. Now, most of us don't think in terms of if you have a gun on, you know you have it. It's there. It, it's there's a sense about it. But most people have a knife in their pocket and they carry it for a defensive weapon. Same thing, protect themselves if they're under attack. But the principles are exactly the same. You never pull the, the knife out until you intend to do what? Kill the other person, okay? You wouldn't pull the gun out and say, well, I'm going to shoot the guy in the foot, or I'm going to discharge around in the air or in the ground to scare him, or I'm going to wave it around. You pull the deadly weapon. Guess what happens then? It's gone from an altercation Immediately, the second that knife comes out of my pocket, the second that gun comes out, now it is use of deadly force. Okay? Doesn't matter if you discharge it. Knife, all you have to do is have it in your hand. You have now deployed a deadly weapon into an interpersonal conflict. Okay? Now, most people, most schools, etc., that teach edged weapons, martial arts stuff with knives, they teach you techniques and things, okay? Most of the good gun schools also have a whole bunch of information about legalities and things like that. In the martial arts world, because they're not from the gun uh, culture, if you will, generally, now they are because things have changed in the last 20 years or so, but they still treat a knife as a, like a stick or a, a uh, cubiton or something like that. I mean, for God's sakes, you pull a knife out and you got these guys that are talking about, well, you strike them with the sharp end of the knife and all that. You know what? You got a knife in your hand. It, it's, whether it's closed or open, it's a deadly weapon. It's come into play. I pull a knife out, it, it's open. Okay? There's only one reason I have to pull that knife out, and we've already discussed that. Two things become paramount. The most important things at the instant that you pull out a deadly weapon, okay? You have to be willing to use the weapon, all right? Now, you have to be literally willing to kill another human being. That's the only reason you pull it out, okay? But most people don't think in terms of like that. I got my knife, I'll just pull it out. If the guy's after me, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, no, it, it's, there are very, very important determinators that decide whether you should deploy a deadly weapon or not. I need you to be aware of those things. And like you said, you must be able to justify that you had no other choice and that you had exhausted all other means to stop the threat. And that includes running away. Okay. Now, I will say this uh, for any of the gals that might be here. Uh, women can get away with a lot more in the eyes of the law because you, there is a great disparity of force that is automatically assumed between a man and a woman. Okay? Two women fighting, that's... Now we're even Stephen again. But between a man and a woman, a lot of times if a woman pulls out a gun, even if she doesn't discharge it, or if she does, the, the law is willing to say, look, there was a great disparity of force there. We're going to say that she was justified in using that. 
I'm not saying to use it, of course, only during dire and extreme circumstance. The justification for the use of deadly force. All four of these things must occur. They must happen before you pull that knife out. Number one, the threat must demonstrate intent. The threat must indicate to you by some means that he wants or intends to harm you. I'm going to kick your ass. I'm going to F you up. Okay? That's intent. I've stated it. Okay? He must show means. He must have the means to carry out his intent. Disparity of force, like I just mentioned, between a a big biker and a, and a five foot three inch gal, that's a big disparity of force. Size, having a weapon, having a club, a tire iron, piece of rebar, pipe, or a gun, or a knife. That has shown now that I have intent and I have the means to hurt you, okay? Number three, opportunity. The threat must have the opportunity to reach you with those means. If a guy pulls out a, a Viking axe and says, I'm gonna, Ernie, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut your head off, and he's standing across the street, I can't pull my gun out and shoot him. Because he can't do that from across the street. He has to be in a position, proximity to me. If he's standing there with a with a 308 wind mag, yeah, he can reach out and touch me. But he has to be able to carry out his intent and means. If he's across the parking lot or a car between you or something like that, uh, it's not going to read well in the in the eyes of the law. You need to be able to say this guy was he was going for it. He was at me. I couldn't. He was you know, dodging his blows. Whatever. It's got to be that close. Depending on the weapon. And the last, but also most important, is the action. The threat has to act. Ernie, I'm going to cut your head off. And he's swinging the axe around. If he doesn't do anything and just puts the axe down and leaves or just stands there for an hour, you know, saying that, I still can't kill him. I still can't shoot him. I still can't deploy a deadly weapon into that uh, equation. So he has to have intent, means, opportunity, and demonstration of action that he's actually going to carry out the, the act. The first punch, the first swing, the first shot, whatever it happens to be. And in addition, because when all the dust settles out and you've got handcuffs on and you've got to go before a, a prosecuting attorney or a DA uh, is making a decision on whether to prosecute you for doing something illegal, murder, uh, whatever the case may be, you're going to be in front of a jury at some point, unless they dismiss it as a righteous uh, action on your part. When you are in front of a jury, you have to be able, and this is where attorneys come in and get a very good one, but you also have to tell your attorney one important thing, because I, I work for the prosecuting attorney, attorney's office for, the, for uh, Los Angeles, and I've gone in and done a lot of consulting work and, and testified on the stand in, in, in a number of death, uh, death penalty cases even. You have to convince the jury that you had no other choice, that the bad guy forced you to do everything that you had to do, everything. You exhausted every possible way to stop this situation, and he would not let that happen. And it's called preclusion. And that is what's going to determine whether you end up with, a, with free room and board for the rest of your life, or you can go home and have dinner with the wife and kids. You have to be able to demonstrate that there was nothing else that you could do, and he forced it on you. 
Not just that there was nothing else you could do, but he caused everything that happened to him, he caused it. Now, when you get an attorney, one of the things that, that, that I have to deal with a lot of times in a police officer shooting against a knife is we have to, every single time, every single time, we have to prove to the jury that the knife was a deadly weapon and that the bad guy had the knife in his hand and the police officer was justified in shooting him. Now, do, uh, are there any police officers in here? Okay, are you familiar with the Twiller, uh, the Twiller law about the 21 foot? Okay, so what, what, what's been proven and what gets demonstrated a lot of times is that from 21 feet, if I have a knife in my hand, I can get at you and attack you before you can get your weapon drawn, if your weapon is holstered, before you can get your weapon drawn and brought up to center a mass. I can be on you, touching you with the edge of a, of a knife, okay? That's how fast these things happen. So you need to have an attorney that can, and when you talk to the attorney, you have to, if, if I'm in a deadly force encounter because this guy had a knife and I had to pull out my knife as my last resort, or a gun even, you need to tell your attorney, you need to be able to prove to this jury that that knife is as deadly a weapon as anything that God ever created upon this earth, and that he could get to me within 21 feet before I even have a chance to react, okay? We're going to talk about that reaction, action turnaround in, in just a few minutes. Now, for further discussion and information, you can go to the website, the ErnestEmersonPodcast.com. I have two very, very valuable documents that are on site there uh, that you can download. And one is the legal implications of self-defense, and the other one is, is uh, the use of deadly force. Uh, they're, they're good things to have. If you have a school and you're teaching your kids the things that, that we're going to be doing today, or, and even in the jiu-jitsu, because there is a... You know, someone can get really messed up with a choke that's held on a little bit too long or something else. So you've got to let your students and your people understand that, hey, you, you know, it, it ain't over when the bad guy's uh, unconscious on the ground. In fact, it could just be starting over again. So now, does anyone have any questions about those, some of the things that I've talked about? Yes, sir. You know what? I'm glad you brought that up. No, no, no. This is this. It, here, here's the deal. Here's the deal. It's 21 feet when I'm in a drill and I know it's happening. It could be 40 feet. Yeah. If I see the guy standing right there and he's got a knife in his hand and someone says go and I'm standing right here with my, my hands like this and I draw my weapon, he's still going to catch me at 21 feet most of the time. That's in a classroom environment and I know what's going to happen. I know he's going to charge me. If I'm sitting here talking to you and someone's over there at that doorway and he charges me, how close do you think he's going to get before I hear the footsteps turn around and boom, I'm on my back and he's got the knife plunged into my chest three or four times. It's actually a lot farther. Now, we're going to talk about situational awareness in a minute too because that's part of that, that subject. But yeah, that's 21 feet when I know it's going to happen. In fact, it's, it, it's interesting to say, look, I can have a bad guy standing right here in front of me with a gun tucked into his waistband. I can have my weapon like this. That guy can pull the, the gun from his waistband and shoot me before I can go from here in a down ready position to here. People do not believe that. If we had a bunch of, if we were doing a gun course, I'd, I'd, I'm not Bruce Lee, I'm not Superman. We, you can do it almost, anyone can do it almost every single time. And there's a reason. And again, when we get to the reaction, action, turnaround, I'll, I'll tell you why that happens. So, the principles and strategies of mortal combat, because that's what we're talking about here, okay? Edged weapon, okay? Moral clarity. You have to be okay with hurting a bad guy, all right? 
there's something that takes place sometimes. It's called a hesitation shooting. When a police officer will come into a room and a bad guy standing there with a gun and there's a there's his wife laying on the floor with seeping blood from three holes and the police officer's got his gun on him and the bad guy turns around and wheels and the police officer doesn't shoot and takes a round right through the chest. How the hell could that happen? Because we are not killers. We're not bad guys. We're good guys. It's not in our nature to take the life of another human being. It's not in our nature to hurt people. It's against our nature. Everything we're taught in school, in church, our family values, it's not to go out and hurt people. But what I'm describing is hurting innocent people. Okay? A bad guy is not innocent. A man who threatens myself, my wife, my children, any children, any women, any other guy who can't defend himself, that's a bad guy. I I don't have any sympathy for him, okay? And what I have done and what you need to be able to do is define that moral clarity. Now, when you go back to the Bible and we talk about the Ten Commandments, for example... When it was literally translated from Hebrew, it didn't say, the Sixth Commandment didn't say, Thou shall not kill. Does anyone know what it really said? Thou shalt not commit murder. Killing someone is hurting an innocent person. I mean, excuse me. Murder is hurting an innocent, someone who has not deserved to die. In my opinion, bad guys, they deserve to die. Anyone who's going to propagate harm against myself again, innocent people, people that are defenseless or weak or, or targets of opportunity for their, for their evil, that's a bad guy. You've got to be A-OK with taking them out. Because what happens when you hesitate? The bad guy doesn't. He's a bad guy. He's He's born and bred, literally, sometimes. If you look at the psychiatric uh, literature, about 4% of all people, 4%, 4 out of 100, 4 people out of 100 are born sociopathic personality disorder. With a, with a, they are born that way. They're bad. They don't care. And, and what's the definition of a sociopath? Does anyone? He has no feelings for the, for the well-being or harm or, or empathy for anyone else. It's me, 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 me. I only care about me. And they're the guys that can go in and rape an 85-year-old woman, strangle her, leave her on the bed, go in the kitchen, and, and have lunch. Okay? 4% of the population are those people. And they are born that way. They didn't get that way because their dad beat them up when they were a kid or anything like that. They were born that way. So, again, they're out there. Most serial killers, serial rapists. I I would lump pedophilia into that whole thing, too. They don't care about the feelings of other people. So, thou shalt not commit murder. It's not murder if I'm protecting these people over here. Okay? And I'm okay with that. And you have to be okay with that moral clarity because if you hesitate, we get into a tussle and there's a knife involved and I hesitate at the moment when I knew I could deal a death blow, I may not get that opportunity again. He may get that opportunity. What's he going to do? He's going to kill me. And then he's going to rape the the 14-year-olds and the 15-year-olds and shoot all the rest of the kids in the school. That's what it comes down to. Okay? Capability versus capacity is what I'm talking about. You must have the capacity to use your capabilities. Here, in this room right now, there there are people in here who could blow through most people who walk the face of this earth with one hand behind their back. You have the capabilities to do that. Okay? You train 
hours and hours, years and years and years to get those capabilities. But you have to have the capacity to use it in a time of need. Okay? There's two types of predators that you will run into out there. And again, we're talking about... my, My goal here is to get you familiar with when can I use this knife. I'm, you know... You guys are going to leave here. There's people that have bought knives. There's people that said, Ernie, what knife should I use for for a self-defense weapon? You know, I I need to be sure that I'm giving you not just the tool, but I'm giving you the education about when and how and why you should be able to use that. Okay? Two types of predators. Rewards predator. That's the robber. That's the thief, that's the mugger, that's the carjacker. He is going after a reward. He's the guy that smacks the old lady and takes her purse, okay? Second type of predator. That's a dangerous predator, don't don't get me wrong. Process predator. He does it because he enjoys the feeling of beating the hell out of somebody or killing someone or raping someone. It's a process. It's what he gets off on. Those are very deadly people because they thrive on that feeling of dominance, of fear, and of power. Okay? They attack just for the feeling. And they always pick, like, like a, any predator, there's, there's several things that are in play. Uh, surprise, attack. Nobody walks up and says, I'm going to kick your ass because I want your purse or your wallet. They get you when you're off guard. It's the same thing in... in, in uh, how many people know about uh, tiger attacks in India? And what kind of hat do the guys wear when they're out working in the fields in India? They wear a hat that has eyes, big eyes on the back of the cap. Why? So the tiger thinks you are watching him. If I'm looking ahead... And, and it's, it's same thing here. Mountain lions... What do, what do they, how do they attack? They attack from behind, and they attack the neck. And that's why sometimes a lot of little kids, or even hikers, survive, is because they have a backpack on. And the cat is wrestling with the backpack. But, but I'll tell you what, uh, if they get a hold of the neck, it's, it's all over. Okay? It's the same principle, though, if a predator needs several things. He, he doesn't want to be seen. He doesn't want to be hurt. And he's going to go for an easy prey because he wants to go home at night and uh, watch reruns of uh, Friends. I don't know. Types of attacks. Now, we're talking about knife attacks, okay? Because I need you guys to understand this whole dynamic. Assassination attack, okay? That would be your serial killer. Crime of passion or revenge. Now, I'm not talking about, there's something else we're going to get to that also was a crime of passion. But one of the cases I worked on, a guy found out his wife was having an affair, actually was ex-girlfriend, found out that she was, he he wasn't even with her. But he was so pissed that she was with some other guy that he snuck into the guy's house and with a K-bar, he stabbed him 21 times, 17 of which were lethal stab wounds. Any one of the 17 would have would have killed the guy, but he he nailed him 21 times. So it was assassination, crime of passion was the motive, and revenge. Or, in the military, uh, a sentry takedown. Okay, That would be where you would use a weapon of some type, a knife, a stick, a club, a rock. Generally, you use a silenced weapon, but that is when you would want to use all of those things that a predator needs to use to be successful. Escalation attack. Starts out as a fist fight, turns into a knife fight. Happens all the time. I've sat on a lot of cases where it was a car wars, boom, 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 car stop, I'm going to do this, you're going to do that, blah, 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 fist, boom, boom, guy gets whacked, pulls his knife out, quam. Hits the guy directly in the throat. Cuts his throat. Gone. Didn't start out as a knife fight. 
guy didn't take his knife and put it in his pocket and say, I'm going out and I'm going to cut somebody's throat tonight. But it happened. Okay? So when you get into a fight with somebody, <laughs> you got to be on guard for what it can turn into. I can take this little piece of, this little guy here. I can beat him up. I'm not going to take any shit from him. He's, he's giving me the finger, blah, blah, blah. Boom, boom, boom. We're rolling on the, on the ground. All of a sudden, I can't breathe real well. Guy gets up and runs away, and I've got seven or eight stab wounds uh, puncturing my diaphragm and my lungs. Sometimes you don't even know what happens. Okay? A little tiny knife can still do a lot of damage. And we'll talk about targets and things also. Spontaneous or opportunity attack. Police roll up on a domestic uh, violence dispute. They come into the house. The husband's being a jerk. They start wrestling them down. The wife grabs a knife and whammo, nails one of the officers. Okay? Wasn't a fight. She didn't think she was going to stab somebody that night. It was a spontaneous reaction. Dondo Beach, about seven or eight years ago, 4th of July, on the boardwalk. The strand, I mean, uh, along the beach where all the bicycles and everything go by. People's houses and their yards go right up to there. There's about a 15-foot sidewalk there. Guys were having a barbecue later that day. Somebody showed up. A little old lady, a homeless lady with her shopping cart and sat on his little stoop that's out there in front of their house, the steps that go up to his yard. Husband and wife, they're getting ready for the barbecue. The wife goes, honey, you, you, get, you got to tell her to leave. You, she can't be here when our guests arrive, okay? You got to tell her to get the heck off our yard. Husband's like, okay, okay, okay. He walks out and he taps her on the shoulder and he goes, ma'am, she has a little steak knife. She goes, bang, stabs him right through the throat. The guy bleeds out and dies right there on the ground. Didn't provoke her. At least he thought he didn't. Again, when you're, especially as police officers, anybody that has to deal with homeless people who are different, in other words, they're not seeing the same movie that we're all watching, they have a whole different idea about what is a threat. They have a whole different idea about what, what your personal space is, okay? I can be fairly close to somebody, a normal person, and not send them into a, a, a fl fight or flight reaction. But I could be this far away from a homeless person who might be a schizophrenic or something, and I might have invaded their personal space. And if, and if that person might be getting ready to, to pull out their weapon. They all have knives. You know, it's, it's a, you got to have something to protect yourself on the street. Cornered animal attack. Third strike felon. <laughs> You're not taking me in. I'm not going back to jail. Confronting a criminal in the middle of the night. The most dangerous type of thing that can happen to you as a homeowner, getting up in the middle of the night when you hear a noise downstairs or something gets knocked over or a broken window or whatever it is, and going downstairs to find out who's in your house, whether you have your gun out or, you, or your knife or whatever it is, that's a very, very, very dangerous situation. Why? Because burglar that goes into your house because he knows you're here at the seminar is a guy who's going in because he knows nobody's home. The guys who break into houses in the middle of the night, they know most of the time there's people there. They're heavily armed, and they will kill you, and they will fight with everything they've got if they get discovered, okay? Just things to think about. Causes of death. Okay. We're talking about knives now. All right. We're talking about any kind of penetrating uh, object. Let's just say that. Number one, cause rapid drop in blood pressure. Okay? Because you're going to bleed out. And that blood pressure drops. You lose unconsciousness. Your heart still keeps pumping. And you die. Okay? Jugulars, femoral brachials, all of those things, that, those things can cause you to bleed out, and you will pass out and then expire. Disruption of the nervous system. 
Brainstem or Brain Case Housing Group, okay? How did the mob used to kill people with the ice pick? You stab them in the heart? Come on. Back of the neck, right up into the, I think it's the medulla oblongata or something like that. Uh, boom, drops you, dead. Stops all control of all your organs, like the heart, like respiration. Restriction of oxygen to the brain, okay? You can die from that too. Now, you can strangle somebody to prevent air from getting to their system. It takes a couple minutes or a couple seconds. Or you can shut blood flow off to the brain. We're all familiar with that, right? Because what does that do? That also deprives oxygen from getting to the brain. The brain is a, is a, the brain's the motor. It's sucking fuel all day long. Every second that you're alive, it's sucking up fuel. That fuel is oxygen that's been brought to the brain along with glucose and some other things. You shut that off for even a second and the brain starts to go, what the hell's going on? And then I'm stopping. Okay? You don't have to be, you don't have to shut that off very long because we all know that. And that's just passing out. Okay? What comes after passing out if I keep the clamp on? So, we talked about some of these things about how to kill somebody. So what are the targets? Both to attack and defend. It's exactly the same things I just talked about. The neck. The neck is probably the most vulnerable part of the human body. Okay? Everything's right here. It's, it's, it's three millimeters below the surface of my skin. That's not a lot of armor, okay? So, offensively, the neck. What, I just talked about the mountain lion and the tiger. They don't go for the leg. They don't go for the heart. They go for the neck, okay? The eyes. That's a, that's a, if you look at a skull, that's a big old opening. Everything here in the, in the eye... Uh, casing group is soft tissue okay so anything that penetrates there there's an open doorway right right to your brain brachial arteries these are the ones that run under your arms okay you cut one of those it's a gusher okay both sides femoral arteries right in here this whole lower part, upper part of the uh, lower part of the groin area, upper part of the thighs. Okay, there there's some muscle around them, but man, wh why do people die in shark attacks? What do they die from? You got to yell. I had to take my hearing aids out to come out here. I'm sorry. Blood loss. They die from blood loss. Where are they usually attacked? On the legs. Yes. So when those when those teeth go in, he's not searching for a femoral artery, but they take a bite out of a thigh or clamp down on a thigh and you've got all those knife uh, blades going into the leg, if it clips the femoral, you're going to die unless you, unless you are cared to immediately. The old French and the Parisians, uh, what did they do with the, uh, when, the, when the ladies would attack with a hat pin? What, what, does anyone know what, what they'd use a hat pin to do? The hat pins are about that long, like a sharp needle. You know how they'd attack somebody? They would come up and they would go boom, 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 boom. And they'd, they'd strike with the hat pin somewhere right in here. Now, what is that going to do? It hurts like hell. All it has to do is nick one of those aortic arteries coming down from the, from the head. And, and the guy would bleed out. So these are the things that kill you. So these are the things you need to protect. All right? Of course, the torso, you've got upper aortas, lower aortas. Uh, you, you, you slice the liver, it's going to bleed. Uh, so again, in order of importance, my estimation, the neck, the eyes, because of course you need your eyes for other things just besides stopping it from, you, you need your eyes to fight. Brachials, femorals, and then the torso, okay? Now, 
I. How, how many people know you get shot by a gun, stabbed by a knife? What, what's the one that's most likely to kill you? Louder? Knife. The knife. FBI statistics, way more likely to die from stab one than you are from a gunshot. Okay? A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't think that's possible. But it's, it's a fact. Okay, we talked about some of those targets that are the ones that can take the life and the ones that you need to protect. But there are other targets, okay? Biomechanical targets, okay? Now, think about this. You get into a fight with somebody, he pulls out a knife, it's a deadly force encounter, you pull out your knife, you get in there and you attack him, and you cut the tendons behind his knee so that he goes down or his Achilles or just a real deep, deep cut to the back of the thigh so that he can't motivate, you can get away because I can get cut and stabbed. I've seen guys that have been cut. They've been slashed. They've been filleted open and still A-OK because it didn't hit an artery or a vein, all right? I mean, horrendous cuts. You take a person, well, when they whipped people, they didn't whip them in the face and all that. They whipped them in the back because they don't want to sacrifice that person who tomorrow they're going to put, or the next day they're going to put back in the field to pick freaking cotton, okay? It's a horrible thing, but there was a reason that these things happened. Sailors on a ship, when they got whipped, they don't, you can't sacrifice these guys. They're necessary to run the, the ship. They flog them from behind because you can get cut all over the back and still survive. Okay? Biomechanical cut, if they, if they whip the guy and, and, and messed up the leg or something like that, the guy's no good. Might as well toss him overboard at that point. When you're in a fight, these are the tendons that are the dangerous ones for you against an opponent, the grabbing tendons. So, the fingers, he has a weapon. If there's some way to cut these fingers from the inside so he can't grab, if there's some way to cut the tendons along the wrist, and again, you might hit an artery. You never know. The tendons along the inside of the elbow to take away their ability to grab you or, or wrestle with you, okay? You, you attack those things. Those are targets of opportunity. Again, because if I'm in a life or death struggle, I'm not going to be reaching down and trying to clip the guy's Achilles because he might be shooting for my net. But if it's there, you take it. All right? Again, principles of combat. Escape if at all possible. Never stay to fight. And if the attacker chases you, run faster okay number one survival tool that has ever existed part of the reason that we are still alive as a species is because we can run pretty damn fast when is it next up you only fight until the threat is neutralized okay the guy's down on the ground or he, or he can't move and he, and, and he can't get at you, okay? That's a neutral threat then, unless he has a, uh, a projectile type of weapon. If you stay to fight when you could escape, if the opportunity to escape, and believe me, believe this, always know this, you're being watched. Somebody's got a cell phone, there's security cameras, you are being watched, okay? You're not going to get away with something. So you have to play your cards right. So, if on that film, the guy goes down, you're on your feet, and you stand there, and he gets back up, and the fight starts again, when it comes down to people in a courtroom watching that video, you passed up the chance to escape. You are engaged in mutual combat. Okay? Now, it doesn't matter if you're the good guy or not. You made a choice to stay and engage in combat. Alright? 
I've stayed a few times <laughs> when I was younger. When is it necessary to stay and fight? For moral or legal reasons? But not necessarily are those two the same. What do I mean by legal reasons? If you're a police officer, you have to stay. You have to stay to control the situation. If you're a soldier who is given a, a, uh, a mission, take down that house, go get that bad guy. You have, there's going to be a fight, sure, but you've got to stay until someone says, retreat, call off the mission, or the dynamics change. Okay? But for the rest of us, and this is me, this is not the legal part, so don't, don't, don't quote me as giving you legal advice on this particular subject right this second. You stay if you have to defend yourself. You have to defend yourself. Okay? If you have no other choice. That is if you are under attack. If I jumped up and, and grabbed you and started pummeling you with a, with a pipe, you've got to fight me off. So you have to stay. You've got to fight or I'm going to kill you. And that's what you have to be aware of. So you've got to hang in there until you get that moment. But you've got to stay. If you can run, go ahead. But if I've got you on the ground or if I've whacked you and I've, I've discombobulated you, and you've you got to stay to protect yourself so I can't kill you or finish my, accomplish my task. Okay? If you have no means of escape or you're injured, bam, I hit you in the leg with a, with a pipe and it, and it messed your knee up. So now it's like, crap, I can't even get out of here. I can't even run. I got to stay and fight. Okay? Or you must stay. Remember when I talked about earlier about the warriors? You must stay to protect family loved ones teammates or innocents what's one of the things that we hear about all the time now that is one of the most terrible things for any parent to ever see on the news child abduction school shootings you gotta stay if you're a teacher you got to stay. If you can get those kids to safety or whatever, then the next thing on your, on your list is to take the bad guy out. If that means throwing your body in the front of his gun, so be it. Okay? Now think about this too. A shooter, when no one opposes him, gets to pick and choose whatever he wants to do. Boom, 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 boom. But the minute someone opposes him, now the choices start to go away, and he's got to deal with the, the countermeasure. So if you're throwing books at him, if you have a firearm, if you're a teacher in a school where they allow you to carry a weapon, the minute that you start, the minute that he perceives a threat against him, he stops shooting kids every time. It's not like, oh, so-and-so, uh, there's rounds coming at me. They're, they're, I can feel them impacting the, the, the wall behind me. I'm still going to go over here and, and shoot at these kids. No, it doesn't happen like that. The minute that threat faces a countermeasure, it takes away his ability to make choices. Do not personalize or humanize the enemy. He is the enemy. The one who is trying to kill you. You cannot hesitate in your action because the bad guy will not. Do not com compartmentalize the weapon. What do I mean by that? I had a question earlier. What, is, what do you mean by compartmentalizing the weapon? Well, today we're here. We're doing an edge weapons uh, training course. So we're going to do edge weapons fighting. Tomorrow we're going out to the range and we're going to do gun fighting. The next day we're going to come back and we're going to do stick fighting. So we're going to learn... Gun fighting, knife fighting, stick fighting. The day after that, we're going to do stand-up fighting. And the day after that, we're going to do ground fighting. No. What are you doing? There's one word in all of those terms. What is it? Fighting. Okay? 
It is a fight. It does not matter what weapon you have in your hand. And if you start to put these things in the drawer, this is my knife fighting drawer. This is my stick fighting drawer. In the moment that the, you know what, is hitting the fan and the, and the difference between your life and death can be measured in a millisecond or a fraction of an inch, you can't be searching for the proper technique or the proper weapon. If you have a gun in your hand, what, my gun jammed, I'm screwed. No, now I've got a two and a half pound piece of steel. I could beat the living hell out of somebody with it. It's that mentality. All fighting is fighting. Then it doesn't matter what weapon you have. And that's why when I said today, when I got that feeling, it's like being in front of a bunch of Navy SEALs because what are Navy SEALs? They're fighters. I was working with a guy one time, it was an SAS guy, and he said, Ernie, it doesn't matter if I had a, if I had a freaking rock or a pencil, I'd kill you. That's the mentality, okay? When are you unarmed? Louder. Never. Once again, never. never. You are never unarmed because you are the weapon. You are the weapon. Everything else is a tool. It just helps you do something maybe a little better. Okay? But if you go and, and become weapon dependent, compartmentalize these skills, when something goes wrong, I've seen guys in, in simulation classes, bad guy standing five feet away from a gun in a in a in a sim, sim gun jams and the guy standing here going for God's sake guess what happened to that guy he got shot seven or eight times and he's dead okay because this gun is my weapon no it's not you are the weapon bad guy standing in front of me my gun jams son of a wham I have to get after him because he's going to take me down I still have my weapon me okay but that happens I have physically seen it and then all too often have heard the results of it what stops violence what stops violence a greater force of violence only that every time I'm not going to go over a lot of this uh, because I've written it down if you have questions about it you can ask me because I'm burning up some uh, good time here but I do want to say that an important thing to remember in addition to what I just said was, was a quote that was told to me by a very, a very, very dangerous man one time. He said, Ernie, you have far more to fear from a deadly man than you do from a deadly weapon. Take away the weapon, what are you left with? The deadly man. Okay? Take away the deadly man, there's no weapon. Always bear that in mind. You are already knife fighters, like I just said. Why? Because you are already fighters. So it doesn't matter if you've got a weapon or not. You are a force to be reckoned with. Now, if we were to go through all of these uh, uh, attributes of a combat mindset, one of those things is confidence. I don't have it written down there, but under preparation and training, my notes on here say confidence in your abilities and capabilities. Confidence, okay? You know you're trained to do this. You know you trained your whole life for this moment, okay? You don't may not enjoy it, but you're ready for it, okay? And at the end, it's, it's uh, important. The last statement in that combat mindset, very, very important, is this. Never quit, never give up, and never, ever surrender. Now, 
I've been more than a couple of times at a point in a very dangerous situation where fuck it I'm done now these involve water they weren't fights but at the last second I was like no way no way no way I'm not going I'm not dying today I'm not dying today and that is what got me through I could have drowned once was in a, in a river when I, in ice fell, went through the ice and one was in a, some really really bad uh, sea out here in, in uh, Southern California if I had given up I'd be dead and I was so close to it because guess what two things happen fatigue makes cowards of us all so being in shape is huge. Knowing that you can go a little bit further. The hardest thing you've ever done, you could have done something a little harder than that. You know that. You know that from being dedicated to this, to this pursuit, this pursuit of excellence. So getting a black belt and training in jiu-jitsu, that's one of the hardest things there is to do, period. That's right up there with going through BUDS training. No bullshit on that. Why do you think it takes 10, 12 years to get a black belt? Because it's freaking hard work. It's tough. It's demanding. You know you can do it. Never, ever give up. In closing uh, on this, remember the reaction, action turnaround that I talked about? All defense is offense. There is no defense. There's no defense. Life or death situation, it's offense. My offense is my defense. Why? What did I just say about that shooter in the school? When he got to choose what he wanted to do, he could do whatever he wanted to do. When I took the choice away, now he's reacting to me. When you are attacked, boom, 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 the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to react. You're going to cover. You're going to go into a, a protective position. It's natural. What do boxers do? Boxers are some of the highest trained uh, guys in fist fighting that exist on the planet Earth. What happens when, the, when one guy opens up with a flurry? Boom, 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 boom. What's the other guy do? He covers. He does this every day of his life for hours and hours and hours. He still covers. It's an instinctual thing. What is the best thing that he can do? There's two things that he can do. What are they? fight back, counterattack, or clinch. Clinch stops the flurry. Guess what? We're jujitsu guys. We all know that. All right? Are there any Marines in here? Okay. Marine patrol is out. A Marine squad's out on patrol. They make contact with the enemy. It's an ambush. What's the SOP for that squad to do? You, you take cover immediately and you counterattack with overwhelming firepower. That stops the ambush. Okay? It's the same exact principle. These principles don't, they don't care where they're applied. They apply across the board. It's the same thing. Guys pounding on me, you guys have the, uh, the technique that, that, that charge the freight train or whatever it's called. I can't remember <laughs> offhand. But boom, you charge in. The minute you do that, it stops him from being able to, to do whatever he wants to do. Okay? And then you can tie him up. Movement, clinch, counterattack. Those are the three things. Getting out of the way, okay, that helps. Counterattack, big time. Clinch, big time. Never do anything that is useless. Your life's on the line. And of course, that also applies to life in general. Don't do useless things, you know. Dan Gable once said, look, if, it, if it's good, do it every day. If it's not good, don't do it at all. Does anybody know who Dan Gable is? I can tell you do, just by looking at your ears. <laughs> he was one of the top wrestlers in the history of the sport. Uh, produced a number of gold medal champions. Dozens of NCAA uh, champions. I mean, dozens. 
uh, probably one of the smartest guys about interpersonal conflict, uh, physical stuff that you could ever run into. Never do anything without a purpose. Again, your life's on the line. Only do what works. That's not saying that a fake doesn't work. And, and I, I, we're not going to have time to get into fakes, feints, and distractions, but that's another thing that never gets taught at a lot of schools, especially boxing and martial arts schools. I, I, I always differentiate jujitsu from martial arts schools, and I came out of that, that entire uh, background, so I've been at a lot of them. They never teach the fake, okay? It's one of the most valuable things you can use. Uh, I remember when Hoist was in uh, the first UFCs and all that, he would do that fake. He'd be going out there with his, with his foot like this, boom, low, high, low, boom, and, and he'd go in and take the guy down. Okay? You've got to think about those things. Your victory relies on three actions. Bias for action. Immediate response. Bias for action. That means I'm ready to, to rock and roll. Okay? Ready to rock and roll. I don't freeze. I don't go into a fugue state. And if I do, it's only for a microsecond because I have forced myself into these situations. Again, with the jujits, you guys fight. Martial arts guys, they play fight. Nobody knows who can beat anybody else in a, in a Taekwondo school, for God's sakes. Sorry, anybody who's in Taekwondo. But you're not beating the crap out of each other, okay? In jiu-jitsu and wrestling, judo, those kind of things, you know. You, I can't take that guy. He'll, he'll twist me up like a pretzel. Efficiency of action. Everything has to be done for a purpose, quickly and efficient, efficiently. Things like this, that's inefficient. Things like this, way more efficient. And violence of action. So... Does, does anyone have any questions at all? I'll do my best to try and answer them with some sense. Where are we? Go ahead, sir. Just referring to your, your literature, the uh, point you made about justification and use of force. Is there, if, if someone demonstrates intent, do you have any legal familiarity with, can I presume means and opportunity? If somebody says, I'm going to kick your ass, I say, bring it. You've been, you, now you've engaged in mutual combat. If I say, if you don't get the F out of here, I'm going to kick your ass. Well, when it comes to the jury, it, even if I am going to kick your ass, when it comes to the jury, I told you what I was going to do, and I told you to get the hell out of here. I'm yeah. You, there, in re, see, there's a big difference between what's going on right here and what's going on when, when two seconds of time is stretched out over two months and you've got a great big picture of you and your jiu-jitsu gi standing there, okay? Big time. I have to be very, very, very careful because if I ever get into a situation, man, I'm all over the internet, I'm all over here and there, they're going to have... It's going to be the walk of fame when I go into a courtroom. So I, I've got to be conscious of that. But, yeah, I gave you the chance to leave. I told you I was going to kick your ass if you didn't get the F out of here, okay? You might not have gotten out of there, but if somebody was listening to that, because, again, it comes down to I told him to get the F out of there. I was going to kick his rear end. And you go, no, you didn't. That's in court with no witnesses. But if there's witnesses, I mean, it, it, again, just assume that somebody's going to be watching or listening. Did I answer that? Okay. Any other questions? Wait a minute. What kind of knife should I carry? <laughs> all right, I'm going to answer that with all honesty. Carry the knife you will have with you all of the time. If it's a little Spyderco, carry the Spyderco. If it's a Swiss Army knife, carry the Swiss Army knife. If it's an Emerson, by all means. Yes, sir. You know, there's always one in every single crowd. <laughs> Now, when I, I'm going to 
I'll follow up with you in a second. One of the things about a knife, though, it's got to be a knife you have with you all the time. Should it be serrated or non-serrated? I don't care. People have a mental thing about serrations. Uh, stand up, please. Can I have that knife? Okay. Uh, I'm not going to wing it, but serrations have a tendency to get hung up on bones and webbing. Okay. Do you think serrations would have gotten hung up on bones and, and webbing? No. Okay, that's all. Um, serrations cut through webbing like crazy. The serrations will always stay sharp, even if I've cut copper with this straight edge of the blade, like a wire or something to get into something. The serrations will always cut. So if I run up, and again, when I say carry a knife uh, with you, I, I say carry a knife with you all the time. That's just my jaded opinion, but you are way more likely to run up on a car accident than to get into a, a deadly force encounter. That can happen too, but how many of you guys have seen a car accident? Okay, my wife cut a lady out of a car with her knife. She was upside down, and, and no kidding, just like the freaking movies, gasoline is pouring out onto the ground, and she cut that seatbelt. I had her cradled, so she came kind of down into my arms, but my wife had the knife and cut her. I cut a little guy out of a, um, an escalator. The, again, this, you can't make this stuff up. His shoelace was caught in the escalator, both of the shoelaces, and he's screaming, it's getting, it's tight, it's tight, it's tight, and these guys are all standing there going, and I had a knife, and I went pop and got it out. My point is, is that, you know, you're way more likely to have to use that knife for an emergency to save somebody than to actually hurt somebody. So have the knife with you or have it in your car or have a Leatherman or something like that. But it's got to be something that you use all the, that you have all the time because you don't get to pick when an accident happens or when you get into an accident, okay? You don't get to choose that. That's an accident. So the... Um, the thing about the knives is it can't be too big. Let me, let me see that. I can't walk around with, with this knife. You know, I'm not in Kentucky and I'm not deer hunting. And, I, and I'm from northern Wisconsin, so I always had hunting knives and stuff and all that. But when I went out uh, on a date with my girlfriend, I didn't have my hunting knife with me, okay? Because it's not socially acceptable to have this. And again, people say, well, what's the proper knife for a police officer? I just made him one, and it's, it's a 15-inch Bowie knife. That's the perfect cop knife. No, it's not. You know where that knife's going? It's going on his mantle. It's the same principle. It's got to be something you can carry comfortably. So it, is, it becomes part of you. It isn't obtrusive. It isn't something that, oh, crap, I, I can't wear my knife with these running shorts. Or I can't wear my knife with my dress-up clothes. Okay? Because, again, you don't get to choose. And a knife is, is, you could say the axe is man's oldest tool. And I don't mean a, a, a woodcutter's axe, but a stone that's been uh, uh, cleaved to have a sharp edge. But right behind that axe, they used to call them, they call them hand axes. I, I actually have some that are about six or seven million years old, actually. What happens with those chips that go on the, on the ground that are those long, graceful chips that I chipped off that stone? Those became knives because they could use those for, for skinning and stuff like that. So axe or knife, mankind's old, well, you could say stick, maybe, I don't know. Mankind's oldest tool. It's not going away. Why? Because it is still a useful tool, okay? It's not just a weapon. Stand in front of a police officer or a jury, then it's a weapon. But again, I know guys that have uh, uh, their defensive weapon is their... Um, is the tool they use on the job. So they're, they're actually able to say, hey, I'm a plumber, I gotta use this knife for cutting this or that, or an electrician's knife or whatever. Uh, whatever works is really what it comes down to. Again, you gotta prove, you know, you gotta prove you're not Rambo if, if, if it comes down to that. So a medium knife, something that you can carry with you all the time, something that, that uh, uh, it, can, it can be serrated or not, I go back and forth but I keep my knife sharp, so I'm not worried about having the, my dull knife won't cut through this stuff. My knives are always sharp, so whether it's serrated or not, I know whatever I've got in my pocket, I could use in an emergency situation. Yes, sir, you were gonna ask me a question. You know, I, I am so sorry. I, 
carry a fixed or a folding knife? I carry a folding knife, and I'll tell you why. A fixed blade is always the best knife to own or to have because it doesn't break. It's not a mechanical device. Uh, if I break it, it's because I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing with the knife. A folding knife is inherently meant to break because it's got moving parts. And Murphy's going to step in. It, it, Murphy never sleeps. So where I'm going, Murphy's law, whatever can happen will happen. So I carry a folding knife because that's what I carry with me all the time. I don't have the means to carry a fixed blade. Sometimes you can carry a, uh, a, a, a what they call a neck knife, which is a little short fixed blade that can go underneath your armor and stuff like that. Uh, but that would be the exception for me carrying a, a fixed blade. I can't carry a big fixed blade. I, I just doesn't fit my lifestyle. But a folder fits my lifestyle and most people's lifestyle. So again, that's why that's why we make a lot more folders than we make make fixed blades. Any other questions? All right. Well, I, I just want to say thank you, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Hoyce. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, V. Uh, thank you to the entire Gracie uh, family. I, can I say. I wanted to thank our sponsors today, uh, Hoist Gracie uh, Jiu-Jitsu South Bay, uh, and uh, they're found at uh, Hoist Gracie South Bay, uh, Hoist Gracie Jiu-Jitsu South Bay dot com. Yeah, and uh, also uh, uh, the Order of the Black Shamrock found at uh, Order of the Black Shamrock dot com, and uh, you can uh, subscribe to the podcast. Uh, you can uh, find us on all the podcast apps twitters and instagrams and stitchers and all that good stuff so we're we're out there and uh you know i just wanted to uh be sure that uh we all take time to to thank all the people that make our wonderful lives possible and uh so i want to just say hey you know what it's time to uh think every once in a while uh, in your busy day uh take the time to uh to think about and, and and if you meet any of these people in person to, to put your hand out and, and thank them and tell them how much you appreciate uh what they're doing and those people are the uh the soldiers uh the sailors the airmen the marines the coasties uh all of the people that uh, wear the uniform or the badge uh, including all of our first responders uh you know those people are out there every day doing uh the, the dirty work that uh, keep us safe and putting their lives and, and their futures on the line. And uh, we owe them everything. Uh, you know, our ability to have uh, uh, the greatest nation that uh, has ever existed on this planet is a result of the efforts of those people, the, the sacrifices that they've made and are, and are still going to be making for us. And it's because of their efforts that uh, all of us can uh, sleep soundly uh, in our beds at night. And uh, we thank all of you and uh, are eternally grateful for your service and uh, all the things that you do for us. And uh, on that note, Danny, I think it's time to say goodbye. Very good. Signing out.